Welcome to Deconstructive Criticism. I'm your host Aaron Flam, and today I will be talking to philosopher Peter H. Hostet, who in his book Nomenotics not only attempts to construct a new phenomenology for describing transcendental states or to be less pretentious talking about trips, he also lists in rather painstaking detail the drugs taken by Friedrich Nietzsche. But first I want to remind you that this podcast is supported by you. So please type in Aaron Flam, that's my name, on Patreon and support this podcast. A few of you have complained that the sound haven't been the best, especially in the Skype interviews. I apologize for that and I promise to buy new equipment. The interview with Peter was done on location at the breaking convention in Greenwich, London, England. The equipment is new, but maybe not up to your standards, so even though I spent almost 8,000 crowns, roughly $900 on it, I think these two might need an upgrade. But since this podcast is a work in progress, I also hope that you understand and have patience with both me and my technical incompetence, as well as the equipment, at least for now. The Breaking Convention is the fourth international conference on psychedelic consciousness, and I go mainly to see Peter, Dennis McKenna, and to make sure that the hippies don't destroy it. It is not my first time in London, but I have never before been in Greenwich, and seeing it I cannot understand why it is beautiful and the conference is held at the old naval college from the days when the British Empire was not only a force to be reckoned with, it was THE force to be reckoned with. In short, it's held at a palace, with park grounds befitting a palace surrounding it. And since I and Peter can't find a room with an outlet, we see ourselves having to try out my new equipment on the lawn outside, which I hope will suffice as an explanation for the ambient noises. It is not my first attempt at interviewing Peter Hustet. Unfortunately, that time, as many before it, my equipment, or rather my technical competence or incompetence, failed me, or did me, well, justice. But Peter recorded his sound in that interview, and you can find my failure on YouTube, and there's a link below this episode on Patreon. Peter is an interesting guy, and as far as this dummy can judge, smart as a whip. Already a philosopher, he has retired himself to Cornwall, and apart from nomenotics, which includes his new philosophy, neo-nihilism, he has inspired Marvel to rekindle the superhero character Karnak, a superhero philosopher whose superpower is being able to see the flaw in anything, be it an idea or a human, and strike at the sore point, as it were, in order to destroy it. My talk with Peter mostly concerns his philosophy, though. And you'll Welcome have to excuse uh, to me if I seem a bit out of my depth. Peter in Peter's Hustet. company, that Peter, can't Peter be too Hustet. unusual. And well, it's actually the second time I welcome you. Yes. Because I tried to interview you before. Unfortunately, my sound failed. Yours worked. Yes. And uh, that talk, can, uh, you posted it to YouTube. So yes. if anyone wants to hear that, uh, they can hear you being precise and intelligent and me being a mumbling fool. <laughs> so uh, Yeah, that's on uh, YouTube dot com ontologistics yeah yeah from about what a few months ago now is it two months ago so yeah and i'll post a link beneath okay. this episode and um you're the author of nomenotics correct uh, is that how you pronounce it uh pneumonautics really but you know there's no no correct pronunciation as i made it up all right <laughs> yes you did make it up and uh, i read it I, I saw it online first and then i read it and i wanted to talk to you because you've invented a phenomenology for hallucinogen trips basically um, well, that's the intention. I don't know. I've, I haven't completed that, of course, but I suppose I've uh, started started the uh, the route. Yeah, and you came into hallucinogens rather late. I did. Yeah, I was. Um, I didn't really uh, dabble in drugs much, except for you know the standard alcohol, whatever. Um, and I actually, it's actually true that I took hallucinogens for academic reasons, uh, basically because I was teaching uh, religious. I was teaching theology as part of the philosophy A level in London a few number of years ago, and. Um, there were all these arguments for God, and one of them was, you know, argument by experience. And of course, you know, it's, I, I never had such an experience, so I couldn't really use reason against it. It wasn't actually a reasoned argument. It was just one of these, you know, if you've been there, you know, it has a noetic quality, as William James said. So anyway, yeah, so I read William James on the uh, religious experience, and of course he talks about taking that, he says alcohol is the first stage of the mystical experience, and then he goes up scale and uh, to nitrous oxide and so that got me thinking that you know if I uh, really wanted to understand this argument I should perhaps dabble that dabble in that myself uh, parallel to that I was very and still I'm very interested in the philosophy of mind consciousness so I, I thought that you know gaining a glimpse of peaks of consciousness would surely inform that discipline and that's how I got into it 
So religion got you into drugs, basically. So that's uh, that's a gateway <laughs> drug. <laughs> In one sense, yeah. Theology, yeah, it's very dangerous subjects, yeah. <laughs> but no, it wasn't. It was parallel, like, as I say, to philosophy of mind. But certainly, the religious element in it is is what first interested people like James, because he was, of course, very sympathetic to the mystical religious point of view. But so, do you yourself believe that uh, religion comes from the use of drugs, for instance? Um, I, it's, that's you know a complex one. Um, of course, that's Huxley's view, Aldous Huxley in Heaven and Hell. Yes. Um, I think it's one. It's hard to prove in any way. I mean, uh, not if you look at the monotheistic religions or the Rig Veda, because there you have a some sort of potion or a fruit or an apple in the Bible's case, uh, yeah. t- and that starts off the story. And basically, they're eating of the tree of. Uh, good and evil, knowledge, yes. yes. Knowledge of good and evil, yes. yes. Yeah, quite right. It's still a slight interpretation, of course, to say that the fruit is something uh, hallucinogenic. But I think, yeah, there's a good, there's, it's very plausible that such experiences did feed into religion. I mean, if you look at Christianity, you know, Nietzsche calls Christianity Platonism for the people. So if you look at the origin in Plato, I mean, I have argued, and not only me, that, um, you know, Plato is known to have partaken in mysteries and he's wrote, written about. You know, really, the first trip reports in the Western canon he, from Plato and the, the Phaedrus, for example, he talks about seeing these uh, sublime visions and whatnot. You're talking about Eleusinian, Eleusinian mysteries. mysteries. Well, well, How yeah. How did you pronounce that? Eleusinian, I believe. Eleusinian. Eleusinian. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I I've only th- read the word. So. <laughs> yeah, it's it's believed he went to those, but not only those. There were a number of other mystery festivals going on at the time. That was just the the, the biggest one, you know. Yeah. Um, but um, it's more likely than not that the kaikia and the potion he took, or uh, participants took there, contained some kind of hallucinogen, because then they, you know, are, they were supposed to fast as well. Uh, they went into a dark space. They saw visions. So it's more plausible than not, I believe, to say that there were hallucinogens there and the mysteries. And then there's the whole route of Platonism into Christianity, um, the Holy Spirit, you know. Um, and so on. But uh, at the same time, I mean, you know, being a good Nietzschean, uh, <laughs> I see a lot of power structure in religion as well. So I think some, some religions, um, you know, just are forms of control. Yeah. Um, and Keep the ritual, forget about God. Yeah, so maybe there was an original ritual and an original experience, but that quickly got taken over. But I think it's hard to prove it, really. I mean, there's no definite proof, but it's just a matter of plausibility, you know. Yes, it is. And that got you curious, and then you started off by taking what drug? Um, I started off with uh, psilocybin mushrooms, and liberty how old caps. Were you? I was in my late 20s, I'd say. That's uh, a rather late start. Yeah. Well, I was, it, yeah, it was. And like I said, I never really had any interest in taking them before then. It just, just didn't concern me until I realized the significance that they might have. And that's why it's sort of overtaken my life now, when I not only has that um, sort of uh, belief been verified for me, introspectively, but, um, I mean, the experience itself is so life-changing, I think, as you probably know. I mean, it's just, you know, understanding the powers of the mind, you know, what the mind can attain. It's just so shocking when you first take it. I mean, you know, after a while, you get used to these these sort of uh, notions, but... When you first take them, they, it's, you suddenly realize that the human mind has, has so many more powers than one could ever imagine. Literally, you can't, you can't imagine a psychedelic experience. It's beyond imagination. You watch it, and you try to take in parts sometimes. You know, it's all there, but your focus can only be on parts. And that's why we need a phenomenon- phenomenology. Thank right. you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, you know, phenomenology is a philosophical discourse uh, from Husserl and so on, Heidegger, um, Merleau-Ponty. But it's never really, you know, it hasn't been applied to the psychedelic experience. I mean, in a way, the psychedelic experience is so uh, multifarious that it, it needs a whole, one re- almost needs to be- start again. And I've only touched upon the idea, really. I mean, I haven't started analyzing concepts and, and so on. But, you know, there's a platitude um, in conferences such as Breaking Convention, where we happen to be, that, um, you know, the mystical state is ineffable. As William James again, you know, it's one of the four criteria, criteria of the mystical state. But, of course, 
it is a, it is ineffable if you don't bother trying to analyze it. But you might you might put the effort in. It would have to be you know introspection, obviously, and come up with a whole new field. So that's something for the future. Yeah, some would argue that consciousness is a lived experience. I think it was Sartre. So uh, you can never really transmit the experience to someone else, but as a philosopher, it is your job. True. And without words, you can't do it, because no. that's your medium. That's right. So you'd, you'd probably have to invent words. I mean, you know, like Whitehead is one of the philosophers I study, I, I focus on, and he, he had to invent a whole new vocabulary to transmit his ideas. That's why, it takes, that's why he's very difficult to understand at first, because he's using words such as prehension, actual entities, or whatever, eternal objects. And that's not just to sound clever. I mean, there's a good reason for that. It, the reason is that the words we already have have such a history, so many connotations, that they can't be... Um, if you use them, you immediately bring in those meanings. So the need for a new vocabulary to express a new philosophy is um, obviously an essential aspect of Whitehead's philosophy. And I think the same thing will have to happen with uh, psychedelic phenomenology. But of course, those people not experienced in psychedelic phenomenology still won't be able to understand, understand it. Yeah. yeah, but a month because I have experienced it. I read your book, and I'm not sure I understand it. <laughs> but you know, if there are common experiences in the psychedelic state, which I believe there are, then eventually you'll have a an increased vocabulary, increased conceptualization of it all, because it's so so alien. It's a very difficult task. I think you know you have to be. I think it's useful to have a background in phenomenology to look out for certain similarities, perhaps. But um, it is difficult. I mean, for example, I've experienced emotions. I can just about call them emotions, which I've never, I had never experienced in my, let's, you know, inverted quotes, normal reality. And I, I can't, I've only had, I only had some of them once, and I can't remember them. But I, all I remember is these are radically alien emotions fascinating thing. Um, one gets a glimpse into other modes of being subjectively, which is very interesting for the philosophy of mind generally. I mean, if you consider, for example, Thomas Nagel's famous essay, What Is It Like To Be A Bat? Um, you perhaps don't come to understand that, but you come to understand what it's like to be um, another conscious being, you know? Yes. Uh, which is, in itself, has so many ramifications. So, let's say such an alien emotion comes up a number of times in the experiences. Um, you know, you can create a word for it, and perhaps you can then ex try to express that word to others who might uh, come to understand it. But it's tricky because in everyday language, emotions are usually expressed through behavior. You know, so um, if a child cuts itself and cries, you, you say that's pain. It will understand it, and you will understand they're having that emotion by inference. But with the psychedelic state, that's not obvious at all because often the body is completely static. So can you uh, exemplify, can you, uh, can you take one of the emotions that you've tried to describe with a new word and then try to use, well, existing words uh, to describe what you mean by it? I suppose it, I, it's, it's a bit, if you know in theology something called the via negativa, it's, um, it's a method of uh, trying to uh, describe God, but purely negatively. So you say by what he not it, yeah, what, he well, what he isn't. So God is not great, and he's not small, and so on and so forth. And you eliminate all concepts until you reach something which is still positively indescribable, but at least it um, takes away from takes away false understandings of God. I'm not saying that's necessarily a legitimate thing in theology, but nonetheless, when you when you ask me now, or, you know, off the cuff, um, to do that, I would say something like, you know, well, it's. You know, emotions can be categorized in certain ways, uh, very basically as desire or fear. Um, it's a desire to run away or, or escape. So it's not, it's not pleasure, it's not pain, it's not, a, it's not visual, it's not perceptual, it's obviously not related to the body or needn't be, or well, some of them are, but not this one, and so on. But I, c I could never, never, I mean, I'd have to make up a word, and then you, I'd say, you know, I understand what that word means. Uh, you don't, um, but at least you know it's not these things. But of course, if you're a Wittgensteinian, you wouldn't accept that either. I mean, that would be like the beetle in the box, of course. Yeah. But I, I don't accept that. But so. where do you start? I mean, so you start by trying to identify the common, uh, what you believe to be the common emotional states or uh, visuals or um, other sensory things that happens to you during the hallucinogenic trip. I mean, you can start with basic things. I mean, a lot of um, trips are obviously visual, so you can say you can say that for a start. It's visual. It contains colors. Uh, it's dynamic. Um, 
often an interesting thing I notice often is that a percept and a concept somehow come together. So you, you're not quite sure if you're having a concept or a perception, which at the moment, of course, sounds very vague because we're but completely you're sort of basically to synesthesia. It. Well, almost, but I think synesthesia is more like a crossing, isn't it? So you, you would see a sound or hear a color. Whereas this is more of a mixture of both at the same time. I suppose some synesthetes might experience something like this. And perhaps, perhaps the psychedelic experience is somewhat akin to that. But, you know, we have the word percept, we have the word concept. But do we have a word for the combination of them? Not really. So, but we have theses, antitheses, and syntheses. Yeah, y yes, you have that Hegelian uh, triad. But still, that... That doesn't, a synthesis even doesn't really, yeah, okay, like I say, synthesis is just equivalent to a mixture of the yes. two things. Okay, it's a mixture of two things. But still, can a person who is, who is not experiencing this will find it very hard to imagine what that really entails. Whereas, you know, on, on the psychedelic, when you're having it, of course, it's immediately obvious, completely obvious. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a massively difficult task, the sort of phenomenology of this. And maybe it's not even possible. I don't know, but it's an interesting thing to... Spend your life doing. Yeah, yes. <laughs> waste, your, waste your life doing, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, last time we discussed the neo-nihilism that I couldn't really break because uh, uh, you had uh, built into your new philosophy that you've written about in the second part of the book. Right. You've built in that you can't really use it as a moral for other people, only for yourself. Yeah, so you were talking about the paradox, you know, should you follow neo-nihilism, that would be a prescription, and I'm saying that all prescriptions are not logically, um, can't establish But isn't that states. itself a prescription? No, it's not, because I'm saying, if you want to be logical, then you ought to follow this. Now, that's uh, what Kant calls a hypothetical imperative. It's not a categorical imperative, and for Kant, these were the normative moral yeah. imperatives, you know, like, that don't kill or whatever. So if you want to be logical, then you ought to understand that this is the case with moral prescriptions. Um, if you don't want to be logical, you needn't follow that. So therefore, it's not an absolute prescription. It's not normative in that sense. It's only hyper... It, it is normative. Every ought is normative, but it's only a hypothetical rather than a categorical one. Last time we spoke also, I, I told you about my worry that uh, uh, this second wave of uh, psychedelic... Uh, the psychedelic movement would uh, be destroyed by the hippies, like the first one was. And now we're at the breaking convention. Mm. Do you see that risk around here? Um, I d no, well, no, I don't think it's a danger. I mean, uh, if you look around you now, you'll see, you know, a number of scientists, you know, and, and of course, you know, neuroscientists, and they bring a certain level of respectability to a field, obviously. And also, if not... We have mathematicians here, psychiatrists. Mathematicians, yes. I would say and of there course, are hippies here, but they're like 10%. Yeah, and mostly therapists. So it seems like you know, a good way to bring psychedelics into mainstream acceptance is by emphasizing the therapeutic potential of them. Because who can be against that? You know? No one can really be against um, you know, medicine. You know? So obviously this is the stance that is focused upon now, and I think half the talks here about therapy. But for me, this is not the interesting thing about it. This is almost like a, you know, a bonus. Yes. But the interesting What thing it, yeah. is the consciousness itself. You know, it's, um, I'm sure movies are psychologically beneficial for people. That's not the value of movies, though, per se. It is a bonus effect, but it's not what makes them interesting or different. You know, a lot so, of things have therapeutic benefits. But when you say that consciousness is the interesting thing, What is it you mean? Are you talking about taking human consciousness to another level? Yeah, essentially, I suppose. So, I think a general mainstream view is that psychedelic consciousness is some kind of, you know, kaleidoscope vision. You see colors swirling around, and you feel a bit sleepy or something, and that's it. But it's, I mean, that's such a small fraction of the psychedelic state, as you know. You know, the experiences I've had are so overwhelmingly beautiful, um, sublime, in the old Kantian, Burkean sense, you know, overwhelmingly powerful, completely unexpected. You know, so people think maybe your past life comes up to haunt you. I mean, that can happen, but sometimes just you, you, you perceive things which you have no interest in. You know? <laughs> They just come to you in exquisite detail.
I mean, I've got no, I've got no particular interest in um, spaceships uh, or aliens. Well, I am interested in, in them generally, but you know, I've had so many experiences going into spaceships <laughs> and seeing these most amazingly beautiful shapes, spacecraft, in exquisite sort of uh, colors and materials. I remember this one spaceship, it had sort of a window which sort of uh, folded in, uh, but it was made of some kind of metallic pink pottery, you know? <laughs> it, I'm not sure I've visited that specific spaceship, but I have been on my fair share. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. but, but do you really believe in aliens, and sp that you actually go into spaceship and aliens? No, you don't. No. It's uh, some sort of um, metaphor <laughs> for your mind to try and explain the experience, right? Well, I mean, it's certainly, a sp in, this, in that particular case, spaceship is the right, almost the right word. Um, but sometimes, of course, those spaceships are organic, so they seem like beings themselves. There's actually a very common sort of experience of thinking things are, have their own subjectivity. Now, the question as to the veridicality of these experiences is the, one of the big questions here, really. So, obviously, you know, a number of people think these beings you see or whatever, they actually exist. I mean, by which I mean... Not physically, obviously, but they have their own perspective, um, which is not yours. I know, and this is actually one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, interestingly enough, because here it says panpsychism or pan experientialism mm. may seem prima facie, unbelievable to many. It must again be realized that the currently popular paradigm of materialism has reached a cul de sac to believe that mind is a product of matter produced by the activity of artificially differentiated elements of reality can only lead to the hard problem of consciousness, solipsism, and a profusion of mind-matter paradoxes. Mm. Yes. What do you mean by this? Well, by panpsychism or pan-experientialism, first of all, I mean uh, that, that is the notion that everything contains mind, um, sentience. Not consciousness, necessarily, but um, a basic form of subjectivity. Pan-experientialism is is the word for Whitehead's version of that. Um, what do I mean by materialism reaching cul-de-sac? Well, there is no matter how much neuroscience we achieve with regard to um, understanding the correlates of psychedelic consciousness, even if we gained a full neuroscientific understanding of what's going on in the brain when one is perceiving these spaceships or whatever, it's still left unexplained is the issue of how that relates to the sentience itself, which is uh, seemingly non-spatial. So how can something which is spatio-temporally describable, brain activity, how can it produce something which is not spatio-temporally, or not spatially rather, describable? So these emotions, you can't describe an emotion in terms of, uh, you know, centimeters, or whatever. This is known as the hard problem of consciousness, how how, uh, we know there are correlates between the brain and the, and the mind, of course. We, you know, no one denies it. They've known that for hun hundreds, if not thousands of years. The question is, why should this produce, if that's the right word, consciousness? Or why should it be identical to consciousness? Or why should it interact with consciousness if you're a dualist? These questions are still completely unexplained. But, but do, you, do you believe that uh, mind uh, comes from the brain matter? Or do you believe that mind manifests itself in brain matter? My view at the moment is that by the word matter, we have an abstraction. So it's only a partial explanation of what is there. If you look at the history um, of what is meant by matter, um, you'll notice it changes often. Um, Ernest Nagel writes about this very well in The Structure of Science, a great book from the 50s, Philosophy of Science. So the notion of matter changes through the ages, and we add on um, aspects to it as science progresses. Um, but from the elements of matter which we now know, um, there is nothing within those core elements that can explain mind at all. So therefore, my view is that our understanding of matter is far too narrow. Um, it seems the, the most plausible way of explaining how matter and mind are related is by, by the radical step of claiming that all matter already contains elements of mind. It was always there at the beginning, if there was a beginning of the universe. Um, William James writes about this, interestingly. He says, if you believe in evolution without jumps, you'll find it very problematic to believe that there was then, you know, matter which developed. And then at some stage back in time in history, 
suddenly there was what I call the, the, the big pang, pang of consciousness. Um, how is it that, let's say a small organism, how is it that suddenly the movements, the molecules between synapses suddenly led to how, no matter how vague or, or lacking in intensity, but how could something which is purely spatially describable suddenly jump into something which is not? This is a real radical claim, really, to, to, to believe that first there was no sentience and then boom, there was. Uh, it's no good saying, yeah, but it's a very small amount of sentience. The point is, this is different in kind in terms of description. So, is it not more plausible? And William James himself came to believe this later on in life, in the, for example, a pluralistic universe. Is it not more plausible to assume that sentience, and by sentience, I don't mean consciousness as we have now, but, you know, some kind of, something analogous to basic desire or fear. Is it not more plausible that that, was all, that has always been an element of matter? And what has occurred is, along with the evolution of matter, into you and I, um, the evolution of mind itself. So we have then not a difference in kind in evolution, this big pang, but rather difference in degree. Make, that's one reason why I think panpsychism is actually m much more plausible than a materialism, which says that the fundamental core um, element of reality is matter. Okay, it's a vague term, but basically it's something that is spatially describable, has causal effects. Um, and that's it. And from that, we can build up this notion of, of mind. I think that doesn't work. I mean, analogies are... I mean, the paradigm, the common paradigm now is emergentism since the 1970s, J. Wong Kim says, which is that, you know, the mind emerges from the brain. They used, in the mid-20th century, it was more like the, the mind was identical to the brain. But the problem, many paradoxes with that. For example, multiple realization. Um, Hilary Putnam said, for example, that, um, you know, we can... We can have hunger, a human can have hunger, an octopus can also have hunger. This means that hunger, if you cannot be identical to the human um, correlates, because that would then imply that an octopus couldn't be hungry, which seems implausible, right? Yeah. So if we are to assume that... Because and this, they eat. Yeah, right. Yes. So if we are to assume that octopuses can have hunger, um, as opposed to assuming they can't, then we have to realize that hunger itself can't be identical to a brain, to brain activity of you know, of a human. So anyway, so uh, w uh, moving away from identity theory had emergentism. So then the, the, the general, it, it's an argument by analogy, really. In nature, you have emergent, emergent levels. So, you know, a classic one is liquidity from molecules, you know. And just like liquidity emerges from molecules, so consciousness emerges from um, complex neural networks. But, see, but, yeah, because, but, yeah. but, but that, this is a disanalogy, I think, you know. Because all of those other ana um, forms of analogy in nature are always from the spatially describable molecules to the spatially describable liquidity, uh, or whatever it may be. All cases are like this, epistemically, spatial to spatial. But with the mind, it, it's different, you know, because there you have the purported notion is that from the spatially describable, you get the non-spatially describable. But one of the examples you use to, to prove this point, I think, I believe it was a, you use a mold, there is a mold uh, that can remember what shape it has been if the shape is changed by an external force. You remember this example? Use it as an analogy of memory, as an explanation of what uh, consciousness might be. Oh, in Bergson, relation to Bergson, you mean? Yes. And you exemplify by saying that there is a mold, and this mold, and I know of this mold, so uh, because I've read about it, I think in Nature, and this mold remembers what shape it has been. So if someone like pushes it or pushes a stick into it, it, it reverts back into its original shape. Slime mold, uh, you're talking about. Yes, yes and right. you, you, you would uh, interpret that as memory. I think I would interpret it as uh, nature taking the path of least resistance back to the shape that would waste the least amount of energy. Okay, well, I think the point I was making there is that you needn't have a brain to have memory, and as is exemplified in slime mold, for example, and, and uh, the... the memory plant, I think it's called. Certain organisms then show a memory, but of course your point here is that it needn't be sentient. My point, yes, uh, yeah, because uh, as a test to myself, because I do a lot of these things, uh, which uh, gives me a lot of what I guess you, you could call religious experiences or, or uh, trips into relativism or uh, whatever, 
that I, I always, uh, first, the fir my first thing is that I always try to think of it as reductionist as possible. Okay. As a test. Yeah, well, of course, you can't prove that an organism such as slime mold, uh, because it physically remembers something, therefore has a, has a sentient correlate of memory. I accept that. That's true. But if you combine that with arguments for panpsychism, for example, the hard problem of consciousness, um, then it seems more plausible that there is a form of memory because, you know, in many respects, consciousness is memory. I mean, that's what Bergson says. Everything we see is a sort of um, contraction of many moments into one. So if there is sentience at all, there has to be memory because perceiving is memorizing or contracting, as I say. So therefore, the slime mold example and others like it are not proofs, but they are indicative. Of but in the philosophy, with regard to consciousness, it's never a matter. It's not science, so there's never a matter of proof. I know. It's just most plausible explanation. How do you explain um, paradoxes later down the line? Such the main one being then the emergent problem, the hard problem of consciousness. What what axioms do you have to go back and change in order to make more sense of that? Um, you say you go, you revert to a reductionist mode just to see if it can be explained that way. I always revert to reductionism because if I don't, I get stuck in paradoxes. Okay. Well, all I'd say to that is, if you mean by reductionism, reduction to matter only, as an explanation. Well, um, I incorporate e energy. I accept that. So matter energy, you mean? And uh, matter energy possibly fields, but I'm not a physicist. I'm a comedian okay. for God's sake. All right. But yeah. fields, we, we can still describe spatially and energy described spatially by its effects. It's interesting that, that that is, you know, the standard paradigm of the age from Descartes, you know, because he'd split reality into mind, which is only human for him, and, and then matter, which was purely mathematically explainable. He's a pure mechanist. But the way I would approach that was to say that that sort of reductionism leads to these paradoxes itself, you know. So, in a way, okay, you try to, exp you can explain, um, you know, a plant, opening its flowers and whatever quite easily reductively. I mean, this is what we were taught at school, right? Um, does that mean that that's the way it is? Well, okay, let's say you assume that, but then you've got these paradoxes later on with something else. So, and also, of course, with a human being, you could, if you, if you imagine you were an alien, you came down to this uh, world and you wanted to discover whether humans were, had sentience or not, um, you could probably cut, you know, cut a person up, look at the brain, discover all the um, mechanisms cool, and, and say, therefore, uh, no, they're not sentient because, you know, these, these synapses cause this patination, this synchronicity, whatever. But, of, but this comes back to my point about matter being an abstraction. So, yes, we can look at the human brain and we see it's perfectly correlated to mind, but with the abstraction, you can't explain the full reality. So, therefore, you have to sort of under realize, or this is my view, that matter then is the abstraction, expand upon that, and then you end enter into panpsychism ultimately. As the most logical, it's nothing airy fairy hippie about it. I mean, I honestly believe this is the most logical view. And I, even I don't believe there's uh, anything fairy about it, not, not at all, because even if me with my reductionist view, and you, and you say you can see that mind is perfectly correlated with matter, well, there are exceptions to the rule. There are mad people who see things we don't see. And so there you have one of the exceptions to the rule or paradoxes again. Yes. And then, the, you know, I mean, there's the case of uh, Dr. Lorber with, with the, um, the patient with no brain. I mean, have you heard that? I mean, that, that's one... Um, no, I hadn't heard No? That. Oh, well, it's, Google it. It's an uh, interesting case. Uh, something like this. So, um, some mathematics student, he got high IQ and very sociable. Normal person, in other words, smart, normal person. Uh, complained of headaches, I believe. So, uh, he went to his doctor, eventually had a brain scan. They discovered he had no brain. You know, he just had a thin film of brain around his skull. But with that, he could operate perfectly normally. Now, and that's, that, that's, Is that true? That's that is, amazing. Uh, everyone, every time I say this to students, they don't believe me. And I say, <laughs> look, get your computers out, Google it. And, you know, it's a, the Lorber case, it's called. And there are other cases like that as well. That's just the most known one. But, you know, that means, that alone means that you can't say that, you know, vision's in the visual cortex, because you didn't have a visual cortex. And it does explain why so many people seem to be lacking a brain. <laughs> yeah. Also, it, it sort of indicates this, that you can have consciousness without a, what we understand by brain. And, again, this gets into pan-experientialism, you know. Um, what, like jellyfish. 
Well, all organisms. I mean, why do you assume that? Or like, um, this is it's just an assumption that you need a brain for consci for sentience. This is um, an assumption based on brain damage, drugs, or whatever. We know there's a correlation. I don't. Of course, I don't doubt that. That, of course, doesn't imply that if you don't have a brain, you don't have sentience. I mean, that's a logical fallacy. So there could be other material subveniences, such as a plant, you know, which has its own form of sentience. Yeah. Um, a plant, you can see the whole plant as a brain, as it were, you know, which uh, you know, transmits information to itself. And by the way, this transmission then is the abstraction. So when we talk about the transmission of whatever it may be, that's, we talk about it in terms of matter, but that, I'm saying that that matter is an abstraction that already contains elements of sentient information that gets transferred. Also, I think there's another political aspect to this, which is that panpsychism was a view that was quite, you know, quite popular in ancient Greece. Even Plato and Aristotle entertained it to an extent. Heraclitus, of course. And then the Renaissance thinkers became very enamored to it, especially uh, including Bruno. You know, um, Petrizzi was the person who actually coined the term panpsychism. And, um, but then the interesting thing happened that church stamped down on this belief. I mean, Bruno famously was burnt at the stake in 1600, not just for pan, his panpsychist view, more his pantheistic views, but nonetheless, that was part of the heresy. Um, the Catholic Church consciously suppressed such philosophies. At the same time, Descartes, writing about dualism, I mean, he dedicated that to the Pope, and of course, that fitted in nicely with Catholic doctrine, you know, Christian doctrine, really, and that was, that was pushed. And so now we are in this state of affairs where we think, most people think panpsychism is something completely nuts. But if you look at why we think that historically, um, you, you can get out of that, that sort of general way of thinking. Because you're, um, uh, you know quite a bit about uh, the history of philosophy as well. You lecture, among other things, on uh, all, all the philosophers who's done drugs. That was one article, yeah, 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 yeah. yes, yes. So, yeah, no. It's there, yeah. So, so it's very interesting, actually, looking at the history of philosophy because then, and, and its relationship to religion and politics. And religion and politics was more or less the same thing in Europe until recently. In a way, Nietzsche argues it still is, of course, um, subconsciously. But yeah, you know, you, 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 you begin to realize um, the origin of beliefs and then, then you become skeptical of them. Yeah, I understand. And I should also remind you, listening, that uh, all the links to what we're talking about, or most of them at least, will be uh, below the episode on SoundCloud or, or Patreon. So, anyway, and you've signed the book for me, which I'm very grateful for. You are most welcome. Travel well, brother. Yep. Yes. A bit As of, I said, I, I like using the word brother now. Yes, it's a bit of cultural appropriation. Well, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, maybe. But so, I, I'm a nihilist, as you know, so uh, yes. no problem. Yeah, I, I, I know. Uh, and that surprised me uh, as well when I called you the first time because I asked you uh, because I was so nervous about the hippies and postmodernism in general. But then how would you define uh, Whitehead and Bergson? Because you rely heavily on them. How would I define them in what sense? But well, uh, philosophically. If you um, fit them into, well, you, um, you call it the politics of philosophy? I, I prefer not to define them because um, that's why I like the, the prefix neo even. You know, once you define... Um, people or a movement by a word, then suddenly, you know, everything's obviously got its criticisms. And um, if you say you're like an atheist, and people, you know, someone will say, ah, but you're therefore you can't explain the Big Bang, whatever, you know. If, if you define yourself, people will immediately think they know who, what you're saying, and they'll know why you're wrong. Um, so best to come up with a new word or not define yourself, such as pneumonautics. Yes, well, <laughs> that was well done, by the way. Um, so, uh, what are you going to do now? Because you're still doing your doctoral degree. Yeah, I've got a year or so left on my PhD. Um, after that, that's a big question. I've um, just bought a house in Cornwall, so I don't really want to move away from there. But my ideal is, you know, to be a pure author, just write and research and talk, give talks and so on, and, and teach. Well, so plan B is, you know, become a lecturer and teach all the time. But... Having spent the last two years back in university, I realized what a, how restrictive it can be. You know, you spend so much time with paperwork, marking essays, um, managing, you know, infrastructure within the university, applying for funds. I mean, you know, you spend almost a third of your time applying for funding for your next project. It just seems very restrictive. So ideally, you know, I'd be completely free of that. However, um, 
And it would be nice, I think, if you uh, got time to develop the entire system of Numinautics. My ultimate goal in life is to develop a process, no, a power process, some kind of um, combination of Whitehead and Nietzsche, ultimately. So that would be some kind of um, yeah, power process panpsychism, something like that. You know, a, a, a full metaphysic, a system. You know, Nietzsche hated systems. Yeah. And Whitehead loved them, interestingly. You know. But my belief is that Nietzsche was actually developing a system towards the end of his cognitive life um, based on the will to power. Um, that's why most of it is in his Nachlass, his notebooks. Um, they begin to get developed. It's a sort of return to Schopenhauer in a way. He, was, he had a system, of course. Um, Lou Salome, Nietzsche's love, you know, said that Nietzsche was returning to Schopenhauer, returning to this will metaphysics, and, and, and I say metaphysics, understanding that a lot of people think Nietzsche was against metaphysics, but I believe that there was a um, metaphysics building up there, and then unfortunately, you know, in 1890, he went mad, and that was that, and we have his notebooks, his thoughts on it, you know, and some published stuff, like uh, Beyond Good Evil 36, for example, but, um, so I would like to push, I believe that it was a system in the making, most Nietzscheans don't, but I do, I want to push that, incorporate it with Whitehead's philosophy, and, yeah, ultimately create my own, you know, a system, another, you know, philosophical yeah. system, because obviously there are not enough, and there, none of them are quite right. That's the ultimate goal, yeah, so I'm old-fashioned in that way. All right. And, uh, and, of course, combine that with psychedelic phenomenology. That would be part of it. Yeah. It's kind of weird that the Catholic Church didn't like panpsychism, because, in a way, it sort of says that God is in everything. And everywhere. Yeah, in, in that sense, I mean, you know, in the Holy Spirit sense, you're quite right. But I think it's to do with heaven and hell, you know. Um, then dualism works better. Yeah, and also, you know, you know, the question of whether your pets go to heaven and hell and so on, as they have souls, would be too problematic. And of course, in the Bible, it says, you know, um, you should be stewards over nature. And, yeah, you know, it's that distinction. So, of course, in Christianity, there's a whole other debate about, you know, dualism r really was introduced. Uh, into Christianity through Plato, you know. So it's some people say, you know, the Bible itself is not particularly dualistic. I mean, that's a theological debate. The Christian Bible, that is. Mm. Yes, I yeah. don't think it is. Was it First Corinthians fifteen or thirteen, where, or somewhere? I can't remember now. The New Testament, but you know, the rising of Jesus' body was it in spiritual or bodily form? I mean, he's not in the cave, right? Yes. Physically. But, you know, some people interpret that spiritually as well, so, yeah. Anyway, I'm not a theologian, I don't know about that. But, anyway, there's another interesting research um, a project, you know, the sort of, um, the p possible suppression of panpsychism by the church. That would be quite interesting. Mm. And I'm, I'm not sure, uh, if you could prove panpsychism, I'm not sure how I would feel about it. I... <laughs> Uh, because I'm a paranoic, right? So <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to believe it, yeah? <laughs> You're being watched constantly. Well, you? You well can't it actually it, yeah. would explain my paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. yeah. Maybe that it's would... like the grass is watching me. It is watching you, Aaron. Fuck. <laughs> You're not paranoid. You actually, uh, <laughs> yeah. you actually uh, true to reality. Yeah, quite right. Yeah, yeah. that might actually solve your anxiety. Well, I wouldn't, I, well, or maybe I wouldn't, it would make it worse. I don't, yeah. I don't know, one or the other. Uh, be, uh, I, I think that's the paranoic's worst nightmare, to be proven right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So anyway, I want to thank you for participating again. I don't know how much time we have left, because uh, it is past five. Yeah, that's okay. And you had something to do. But I'm pretty sure we'll talk again. Absolutely. Well, I, I, hope, hope, so, I hope to come to Sweden in November this yeah. year. So hopefully we can meet then. It would be uh, my pleasure, and I want to thank you so much uh, for participating. And you can hear the first clip of us talking on YouTube, and uh, you can uh, buy Peter's book online. And it's uh, partially not an easy read, uh, but it is quite fascinating, and it gives you quite a lot of ideas. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it is a mixture of essays. Some are easier to read than others. Yes. Um, no, I, at first I, I started with the feminon, uh, fem phenomenology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that part. That one. Yeah, yeah and, and then I was like, this is too hard, and I jumped uh, straight into uh, uh, neo nihilism, which I found uh, a riveting read. Uh, I, I practically just ate it all up. And then, and then I got stuck in the paradox. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I jumped back to the fem. Well, you, you can uh, yeah, jump into it where you will. I mean, the, the chapter on Nietzsche's use of drugs is you know, easy to, yeah, one to of my read. You know, that's a historical thing rather than philosophical, really.
Um, yeah, so that's the bridge, of course, between the psychedelic phenomenology to the Nietzschean nihilist stuff at the end of the book. That's the bridge chapter, as it were. And if it ever becomes legal, uh, drugs uh, or research on drugs, and you want to recreate Nietzsche's recipes and try them on the patients, then I'll be your first volunteer. <laughs> okay, I'll hold you to that. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Deconstructive Criticism. Don't forget to support this podcast on Patreon. Just type in Aaron Flam, that's my name. And if you're interested in hallucinogens or altered states of consciousness, there are plenty more episodes of Deconstructive Criticism that cover it, and more are to come. For the Swedish listener, there will be more episodes coming soon in Swedish uh, about my ongoing battle with Swedish state television, the censorious left-wing nuts of Swedish social democracy. And if you want me to get the new equipment sooner rather than later, please swish me at 076-8943737. 076-8943737. You can also check out my new comedy special on YouTube, Kejsaren är naken, which finally has some English subs if you're an Anglophone and interested. I am Aaron Flam. And until next time, I hope you have a good time unit.